My name is Lori Alexander and I'm joined tonight by my special guest, YouTuber Orphan Red. We are so privileged to have you with us. Thank you so much. I'm actually really glad to have the opportunity to talk about these kind of different ideas that I usually cover in my YouTube videos. Yeah, I've been actually watching some of your YouTube videos and I got to say, I'm a new flat earther, set out about a year ago to debunk it and I have yet to be able to do that. The Bible clearly says that we sit on a stationary earth. How did you get to where you are today? I mean, we're not born flat earther. No. Well, we are, but then we get taught oh. <laughs> that the earth is a globe. But, you know, it was a really interesting path for me because I was really fascinated by science and psychology, and I really believed in science. And then I started doing a master's, and I started kind of seeing what was going on behind the scenes that you normally don't see when you're just a person that's reading about science findings. And I saw how much of it is just a sham, especially the statistics. So I was really disillusioned and I found that really hard on my sense of what's real and what's true. And then I started watching some Flat Earth videos, I guess. I came across Mark Sargent's 12 Clues about the Flat Earth. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that was entertaining, but I didn't find it really persuasive. I saw Math Parallel's photo or painting. That I thought was more interesting because it brought up that idea of how do you know that you know something versus you just believe it. I came across a video by this German guy who was showing how the flight paths don't actually reflect a globe Earth. They reflect a flat Earth. And I think that that kind of pushed me over into thinking, okay, this is something I need to start taking seriously and actually looking into. And like you, I think initially it seems absurd. So you want to look into it more as entertainment, thinking that it's easily disproved. But the more you look into it, the more you realize, actually, this is true. <laughs> The approach that you take, which I find is most interesting, is that a lot of people come to this thinking the globe is true and the flat earth theory, I need to debunk it. And then they start thinking, oh, it's hard to, to debunk. And then they start thinking, OK, well, maybe there's some truth to it. But I think it should actually be the opposite. People should be coming at it saying, I don't actually know that the earth is a globe. I just believe it because I've been taught it. Because in actual fact, a lot of the proofs of a globe are things that are mathematically too complex for most people to really break down, or they're proofs that you need million dollar equipment to test, or you need to go up into space, which most people can't do. So it's interesting that we default to saying, well, if I can't prove that it's flat, then it must be a globe where I think that what we should be saying is if I can't prove that it's flat then I need to look at can I prove that it's a globe and if in order to do that I have to accept things that I don't quite understand like I don't quite understand why gravity works because they have never found gravitons and you need gravitons for the theory of gravity to work right it's the gravity is a theory it's always been a theory it has never been quote-unquote proven it's well, it's not theory. even a theory. It's not even a theory. It's just a label because when you look at what the explanation for gravity is, it's not an explanation. It's just a description. Right. So right. it doesn't tell you why this is happening. It just tells you what's happening. When you start asking why, they say, oh, well, because gravitons. And when you say, okay, well, show me a graviton. Well, then they say, well, we haven't ever detected a graviton, even though we've spent $14 billion on CERN, we have not yet managed to find a graviton, but we know that they're there. Well, that's not a sufficient explanation. The theory no. of gravity is just a description. It's just telling you this is what we observe, but it's not telling you why. And that's, I think, what globe believers have to really start looking at. Yeah, absolutely. You've got to stop and you've got to think. This whole globe theory or this globe indoctrination is only about 500 years old. Yes. Up until that time, every map that we see clearly shows a flat Earth model. Yeah, the globe theory came up when the church was being quite mean. The Spanish Inquisition, the church was torturing a lot of people, and the church wasn't allowing scientists to talk about the results that they were getting unless it fit with the church's ideas. And so a lot of scientists who saw the globe model, they were like, well, a lot of the data supports both the flat earth model and the globe model, but the globe model goes against the church. And so we're going to side with the globe model as a rebellion against the church because the church was being very controlling. 
I think now we're seeing the opposite of that. Now it's the secular science that's too powerful and that's doing bad things. And I think that's where this rebellion comes in, where people are saying, if both models are very similar in their outcomes, then we're going to start saying, well, we're going to reject the globe unless you can prove it to us in ways that make more sense as a way of rejecting science and saying we don't want to be controlled, right? Right. And and it seems that they're controlling us more by using the images that NASA is providing us. And you can clearly tell that NASA employs more filmmakers, CGI techs than any other government establishment across the board. If you're really dealing with scientific proof of something or you're dealing with an agency like NASA, we're spending trillions of dollars to send up equipment supposedly into space. You better give me a real picture, GI. I don't wanna see a drawing. I don't wanna see a cartoon. I wanna see the real thing. And yeah, they've yet to provide that to us. Yeah, and they're actually getting a lot of money from US taxpayers in exchange for these composite images that aren't real. One of the things I think to me that's maybe the most significant in this idea of belief versus knowledge or science versus religion, science on the one hand, NASA is saying, here are these images of Saturn taken from a probe. But then the same scientists that are backing that up are also telling us that light exists in a superposition state of probability until a conscious observer interacts with it and then it collapses into set properties. But so the probe that's out near Saturn apparently is capturing light bouncing off Saturn onto its sensors. But that wouldn't happen unless you have a conscious observer there to make the probability collapse into an actuality. And so in order to buy into that, you have to think that what happens is that when the NASA scientist reads the digital data readout that was sent from the satellite from the probe, that's when the light is somehow collapsed from a superposition state to a state of step properties. That doesn't really make sense. And I don't yeah. hear anybody else talking about that. And I kind of think this NASA scientist, you can't have it both ways. So either light is real, whether we're there to see it or not, or you're taking pictures of Saturn from a probe. You can't have both. <laughs> You know, it's funny. Someone sent me an email who purportedly works for NASA and sh she was trying to make excuses and she was saying, oh, well, the reason that these NASA images are composites is because we're not actually sending photographic equipment on these probes and into space. It's basically just digital information and then we transform that into images. But then anyone can create the data. <laughs> and tell you, oh, this comes from our probe. And you as an artist, mm -hmm. you're going to take this data and make an image out of it. But the artist that's tasked with that, he doesn't know where that data comes from. He doesn't know if it comes from a probe near Cassini that's sending ones and zeros. And NASA itself admits that they're not actually taking photos. They're just taking data readouts, spectrograph information. So looking at the different gases, looking at the different reflectivity. So it's their interpretation of what we're supposed to be seeing. Yes. And I see a problem with that. <laughs> well, yeah. Because not everybody, not everybody interprets things the same. And also you can't verify it. What I think is more surprising is that if you ask the common person on the street, are NASA pictures actually pictures or are they just images that are created from data? Everyone will say, no, 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 NASA images, they're real pictures <laughs> that were taken from space. <laughs> so we are told that sunlight is white light, full spectrum light, and it goes through our atmosphere. and the blue light gets scattered out, which is why the sky looks blue. And that sunset, because you're looking at an angle, you're looking through thicker atmosphere. And so all the blue light gets scattered out and you end up with a red sky at sunset. That's the explanation that science gives. So what it's saying is that when you take sunlight and you pass it through the atmosphere, that's the thickness of two atmospheres because of the angle at which you're looking, then all the blue light is scattered out and blue looks red. The problem with that is that by that argument, when sunlight bounces through our atmosphere off the ocean and then back through the atmosphere again to the ISS, the ocean should look orange. It shouldn't be blue. All the blue light should get scattered out. So when you take a picture of the Earth from the ISS, the oceans should look orange. 
the blue light should get scattered out on its way through the atmosphere and then back again. Do you know what I'm saying? I completely know what you're saying. And I don't think I've ever thought about that before. That's quite interesting. Basically, light, the different frequencies, the different wavelengths of light go from blue to red. And some of them are more easily scattered. Red is really hard to scatter. So when light goes through the atmosphere, the red light, because it's harder to scatter, is the one that remains. Everything else gets scattered out green, orange, yellow. And so to me, like, I just keep getting stuck on that because that's the easiest, clearest proof. I made a video about it, but I don't think people really understood the ramifications of it. So it kind of just fell into a void of silence. But to me, that's, that's the nail in the coffin that these images are fake. I think a lot of people just in the last 12 months, 18 months are now coming around to even entertaining the thought of a flat earth. So I think that a lot of the videos that you've put out earlier are going to be getting more views as time goes on and the people start awake, you know, getting more awakened to this. And it's not going to fall on deaf ears by any means. I really believe that all this information that's being put out there, especially when alien disclosure comes, people are really going to start questioning things. Yes. Let's talk about the sun and the moon, shall we? Let's. What is the reality of our sun? It's not 93 million miles away. No, and it's funny because when they decided that the sun was 93 million miles away, at the time they believed that the earth was a perfect sphere. And when they came up with time zones, all of this relies on a perfectly spherical earth. It actually throws off all the math for the calculations for the distance to the sun. So all of a sudden, you don't get a consistent answer of 93 million miles when you do the calculation. Mm -hmm. These are things, again, that because it involves math, most people, they just tune that out. They're like, ah, uh, this sounds kind of complicated. I don't know. And so they'll just accept whatever NASA tells them. That's problematic. I used to live and raised in the Buffalo, New York, Niagara Falls, New York area. I spent many of my childhood from the time I was three days old. My grandfather put me up in the bow of the boat. I was on the Lake Ontario for my entire childhood. And I can remember many nights looking across the lake and being able to see Toronto. Yeah. That can't happen if you have the curvature of the earth going at eight inches per mile squared. It doesn't happen. It can't. Well, and the boats on the horizon disappearing beyond the curvature of the earth until you take a zoom lens and zoom in and all of a sudden the boat reappears right in front of you on the same level, level plane. So I think right. that that's kind of nice that we have the technology now to start testing these things for ourselves rather than having to rely on what they tell us. And with zoom lenses, powerful zoom lenses, you can see that things are not hiding behind the curvature of the earth. They're just hiding behind your vanishing point, your ability to resolve images <laughs> that are that small, right? Exactly. And another thing that convinced me was when we measure things, when we build things, we use what is called a level. Yes. We use this level no matter where we go, because we don't have to make, take into consideration any level is level, no matter where you are. And if you keep drawing a level straight line, you can't make a circle out of it. You can't. I think the fact that we're told that things are hidden beyond the curvature when we can now see that they're not, I think that that for me should be very convincing that if science is actually telling you this and you can disprove it with a Nikon P900 zoom lens, then it should make you question some of the other things that science is telling you. I think that's why we need to support each other. I think that's something that I would like to see more of in the conspiracy community, the flat earth community, because that's the thing. We all know that we're all getting a hard time from the status quo. And I think that support can make a really big difference in people not quitting and for people continuing to make videos that kind of benefit us all. So if you're a conspiracy theorist, but you don't really believe in flat earth, I think that there's still value in supporting flat earth YouTubers. And I think the flip side as well. So if you're a flat earth YouTuber, I think that there's value in supporting the YouTube channels that are doing conspiracy theory videos. I completely agree. You know, we do need to support each other because we all bring something to the table. I truly believe that we need to support people because the more science, the farther in technology we get. Oh, getting feedback. That's very piercing. <laughs> exactly. And we tell people all the time here, don't believe a word we say. Do your own due diligence. Study to show yourself approved. 
test all things because that's what we're told to do. And I welcome anybody to debunk what we talk about here. We you have know, to but, be kinder I mean, to each other. We have to be kinder to the people who have different beliefs. I see a lot of scienters, that's what I call people who think that they're scientists, but they're not actually doing science. They're just doing nonsense. But I see them calling flat earthers names and then flat earthers in response, they get angry and then they start calling the people who believe in the globe model names. That doesn't help anyone because you don't want to lose the argument. Even if you realize that the opponent is right, if the opponent's been too mean to you or rude, even when you realize he's right, you still don't want to give in, right? (laughs) So yeah, you're still going to shut down and be like, I don't even care. Yeah. I do want to say, I'm not suggesting that science is bad or wrong. I'm just suggesting that what we mistake for science today is often not real science. There's a difference that isn't really being noticed, I guess. One question is, how does sunrise and sunset happen on a flat earth model? This one is actually quite explainable, but it requires people to think, and a lot of people just don't like to think, so that's the biggest challenge. There are a few things that are at play here. So one of the things has to do with perspective and how our eyes see, how light interacts with lenses to create an image. As things move away from you, whatever is above above you kind of starts to move down towards the horizon line. Whatever's below you on the ground tends to move up towards your visual horizon line. If the sun is moving away from you, it will look like it's moving down towards the horizon line, even though it's not. There are different ways of demonstrating that. More recently, YouTuber Rob Skiba, and his last name Mm -hmm. is S-K-I-B-A, he's done some Mm -hmm. magnificent experiments where he's shown that when you add atmosphere into the equation, so when you look at a sun, so he uses a little image of a sun and he moves it away from the camera, but in between, he puts a filter, a plastic filter that simulates the atmosphere, the water content in the atmosphere, because water we know distorts light. So what happens? happens is that distortion along with perspective where things as they move away appear to drop down makes it look like the sun is setting beyond the horizon but it's moving beyond the vanishing point it's being distorted by the water in the air and the problem with that is that when you see it you understand and it's clear and it actually makes sense but you have to be willing to look at it and think about it and maybe either you have to accept the experiment that Rob scheme is done or you have to do it yourself which requires you to actually get up and get some stuff together and put some effort into it rather than just accept what you're told yeah he's definitely a bright light in the flat earth world and this is something that we don't talk a lot about on the channel it's very controversial i think that it's time that people open up their eyes to this because there is a deception coming yes NASA is part of that deception we just had NASA release that they found a new it's a dwarf star with seven planets around it. And it sounds an awful lot like the Nibiru solar system. What do you think about this new finding? I kind of think of it as Snow White and the Seven Dwarves because it's such a, it's just a fairy tale. It's so fantastical. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. people think that NASA actually saw these planets, but they didn't. They just saw blips in the data that suggests that there are inconsistencies in the light that's coming from this distant star. And the inconsistencies in the light, there's a certain suggestion of a pattern in the inconsistencies. That's really what they saw. And what's more entertaining or amusing is that there are other inconsistencies there that they just write off as, oh, but that's just a glitch in the data. So they kind of arbitrarily decide which inconsistencies are just glitches in the data and which ones are planets. People want the fairy tale. I've got a picture up on the screen of these new quote unquote planets and what the artist's (laughs) depiction is of these planets. I mean, they did say that these planets were orbiting a dwarf star planet. To me, it sounds just like the fabled Nibiru. Well, the Nibiru story is quite interesting. I did a lot of research on Nibiru back in the 70s when I first started all of this. And now looking at it, I don't believe the whole Nibiru thing. I do believe the Anunnaki are the fallen angels. 
So we're looking at interdimensional creatures, not intergalactic or interplanetary creatures. We're looking at these are coming from a different dimension, which is what CERN's trying to open up. Yes, it is. And one of the a supporting argument, I guess, for this perspective, which I have to say, I agree with you. There's a European researcher who was looking at where this story of Nibiru really started. And it was really, what's his name? Eric Van Daniken. And who's the other guy? Sitchin. Yeah, Sitchin. And there's the image of Nibiru. It can also be interpreted as Saturn passing by Aldebaran in the Orion constellation area of the sky. And that was significant to them for various reasons. And so it's really, again, you have this data and then you interpret it and then you make conclusions Mm -hmm. based on the interpretation. And people think that it's the conclusions that you need to argue about, but it's not. It's the interpretations that are the problem. So I think that every few years we hear that Nibiru is coming to destroy the world. I think that there are other things that are going wrong. I don't know that they're caused by Nibiru. If you look at the story of the Anunnaki, if you look at the story of Nibiru, you'll find that there's definitely, it's a good research. To sit there and say that it's not true, I know that it's not because I'm 95% a flat earther now. And you can't believe in Nibiru and you can't believe in the flat earth at the same time. It just kind of contradicts each other. So then I've had to go back and I've had to take a look at the ancient writings and I have to look at it. And I'm, I'm totally convinced that we're talking about the fallen angels here. We're talking about interdimensionals. So Yeah, but here's right. the thing. The flat earth theory, we talk about it as if there's just one flat earth theory truth. But in fact, there are various models that suggest or that incorporate the idea of the flat earth. And one of those models is simulation theory. You could simulate events on Earth in order to mimic an incoming star. Oh, yeah. And I think that's where the deception is going to be coming. I mean, we've got blue beam. We've we've got everything put in place. And I think that we've got these earthquake machines. We've got the technology where they could actually simulate an asteroid coming in and, and striking the planet and happen, but have the effects of that event. Definitely. We can't even believe our eyes anymore. We can't believe what we see up in the sky. What I really see is that over the last maybe 50, 60 years, people have been running away from organized religion in droves. And so I think that there's a lot of truth in religion and that there's a lot of good in it and a lot of meaning and purpose. But sometimes bad people use religion to control people. And I think when people were moving away from organized religions, the bad people were using to control them, they needed something else. And I think that science, that's why I think science has kind of been turned into a form of religion. And Mm -hmm. so then aliens, that's just another aspect of this. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's why we have the Trappist system with the seven stars being discovered. It's all about preparing people, like you said, for this deception so that they can say, here's who the bad guy is and here's who the good guy is. And we're going to tell you what to do so that you survive this and so that good things come from it. Exactly. You know, they always have to make up a boogeyman. Instead of the flavor of the month, we've got the boogeyman of the year. And this is just going to be another form of control. They want to implement this new world order. So what they're going to do is they're going to create this ultimate boogeyman, the spaceman. I mean, we've got the tape of President Reagan sitting in front of the U.N. saying that if we all had to come together to fight a extraterrestrial force, this would unite the planet. And he even went even further by saying, and if this doesn't happen, then we can do it for ourselves. We can create this. Yes. And I think that's what they're doing. I really do. Because it does seem like they're really pushing this idea of saying, look, we found a star with seven habitable planets. The idea of that is to say, the next step then is there's life on those planets. And then the next step is to say, there might be life on other planets that are closer. And actually, that life has come and they're here and the aliens have arrived. (laughs) I feel like science takes advantage of our ignorance in order to tell us this is the only model that works. And they're banking on the fact that we're not going to look into it to find out if there are other models that might work. 
I truly believe that the internet has been a double-edged sword. In a way, it has kept people communicating and lets them keep an eye on us. But and it also gives us information, and we are now have access to these scientific experiments that are happening. You know, we can communicate with other people who think like we do, or we're doing these experiments like we do. And I think it's a double-edged sword for them because creation of the internet, our ability to transmit different information to each other has expanded beyond patients. Back in the 90s, we didn't have, or back in the 80s, we didn't have internet. So, I mean, you could only talk to your friend next door about this kind of information. And I don't think anybody would have come up with anything that we've seen in the last topic happen back then. It's an idea that keeps coming up because there's truth to it and because the globe model has a lot of problems. And so I think in scientists keep coming across information that disproves the globe. And that's why every few decades you get a small flat earth group like, oh, there's something about a flat earth. Sometimes it's tongue in cheek, but that still reflects people's idea of like, oh, there's something not quite right with this model that we're being shown. But the thing is, the reason that I do my videos the way I do, to be honest, is I don't think that the flat earth theory is necessarily about persuading people that the earth is flat, or at least I don't know that it should be. I think that the point is that you need to start thinking for yourself. You need to start challenging science because science, what we call science, isn't science. It's scientism. It's a religion. And people will say, oh, but science has given us all these good things and we live longer because science. Well, we also get one in three women get cancer because of the chemicals that science has given us that we put in our food. And one in, what is it, one in five children are projected to get autism because of mm -hmm. the chemicals that we put in our vaccines. And right. we live longer wearing diapers, living in a nursing home where we're being abused by people being paid minimum wage to look after us. And we have mm -hmm. dementia because of the aluminum in our environment. So is that actually living a better life? And also science has in a lot of ways replaced the sacred and the ritual that religion gave us and in exchange it's given us nihilism and people are depressed and people are not thriving and so they're not really happy so i'm not really sure if what science has given us is measurably better so there are some things that yes you know what we're not dying of infection because we cut ourselves but at the same time a lot of us are getting cancer and a lot of kids have autism and so it's a double-edged sword so i think that to me the concept of flat earth i believe that the earth is not a globe but that's not really what i want to push on my viewers i want to push this idea of i don't really care what shape you think the world is what i care about is that you start questioning when someone tells you we just found seven planets in an orbit I don't know how many light years away, you need to sit down and say, does that make sense? What are the implications? What are the consequences of this idea? Not just the fact itself, but the idea, the philosophy behind it. Like you said, it's the coming deception, but I think it even goes further than that. It's about mistaking belief for knowledge. And that has a lot of implications in everything you do every day. And even in what we accept. So we accept genetically modified food because science tells us that it's a fact, that it's safe. So when, when you start to question, okay, is everything that science says true? One thing I want to bring up is the radius of a proton. Science told us that they knew what the radius of the proton was. It was established. It was a science fact for a number of years, and it was incontrovertible. It was truth. And then all of a sudden, these scientists said, oh, we're going to try to refine it so that we can add a few data points after the decimal. And they found that the radius of the proton was completely wrong by an order of like five magnitudes. So then all the scientists were very angry and they said, no, 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 shut up, shut up. Because if that's true, then all our other theories that depend on that being true are gonna fall apart. So then other scientists said, well, we're going to show you that you were wrong. We're going to use even better equipment, even more sensitive, and we're going to measure the radius of the proton. And they did that a few years ago. And they actually found that it was seven orders of magnitude wrong. And so 
the science, the radius of the proton that had been established as fact and truth for years, all of a sudden they were wrong. And they weren't just a little bit wrong. They were so wrong that all these other theories that rely on that being true are now no longer valid. But here's the interesting thing. They're not actually acknowledging that. And they're not saying, oh, this other theory that we've had for 40 years that relies on this proton radius for it to be true is no longer true. They're not doing that because those theories are still useful. And so that's the thing. Religion is useful. Science is useful. But when it comes to what is true, that's a completely different story. This is what I struggle with because as you can tell in this interview, like I have a very analytical mind and I have a science background and sometimes that's what I find. It's Sometimes it's very hard to communicate with people who have less of a science background or who are less analytical and kind of see the whole picture better than the details, which is not like I'm not saying one is better than the other, but they are different ways of seeing the world. And that's part of why I do the videos the way I do, because I think that there are a lot of flat earth videos that are good for people who are willing to sit there and listen to a man talk for two hours. But there are other people who need something different. I think that there's a different audience. To your question about loved ones and how to really broach the subject, I think the most important thing is this. The whole point here is not to say you must believe. The whole point is to say, do you know that the earth is a globe or do you believe it? And if you just believe it, then why do you believe it? And the reasons that you believe it, are you sure that they're true? Are you sure that those interpretations are right? To me, the easiest thing would be to take someone down to the sea with your zoom lens camera, show them a boat disappearing beyond the curvature, and then just zoom in and show them, oh, look, the boat is actually still there right in front of us. You could probably do it on train tracks, but I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> <laughs> where the train is beyond the curvature, but then, oh, you zoom in and look, there's the train just coming so towards us. <laughs> because I don't want to be just another pusher pushing my ideology on other people and saying, I am right, I have the truth, and you must believe what I believe because what I believe is true and what you believe is wrong. Because oh. then I'm just another scienter. And, you know, maybe it is that parenting style that saying, it doesn't help our world for me to make you believe that the earth is flat. That won't make the world better. What will make the world better is for me to encourage you to start thinking for yourself, to start questioning your world, to start questioning what you know versus what you believe. Because it's not just about the flat earth, like Laurie was saying about the coming deception or the idea of aliens versus interdimensional versus angels and demons. This is broader. And I think that when you start looking at things through the flat earth perspective that I'm suggesting, which is it's not really about the flat earth, it's about determining knowledge and truth from belief, then it applies to all these other domains. That's what's useful. Like if you're trying to convince a family member of the flat earth, then I think that's okay if you want to do that. But I think what will help them more is to encourage and inspire them to start questioning the globe model to say, do you know that this is the only plausible model? Or is it possible that there are other alternatives? Because when they start thinking that way, they'll start thinking that way about other things that we're being told. What is what are you all saying? The, the race is won. Slow and steady wins the race. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Because people tune out after long videos. If, if they don't buy into the concept of an hour long video, then it's just a waste of their time. But if you just give them little snippets here and there, it kind of starts to make them think a little bit when they're in the shower later, they'll think, oh, that was kind of weird and crazy. But that's an interesting thought. It's funny, I actually, I stood up and Lori probably knows the place, uh, Rustler's Roost down in Phoenix. I was with a buddy of mine and we were up on about halfway up this little mountain and we were standing out and I just laid it on this guy. And I'm like, you realize the earth is flat. And he looks at me and he goes, the hell are you talking about? And I mean, he literally did. He looked at me and he was like, what are you talking about? But we were at a point where we could look out and I looked at him and I said, okay, that mountain way out there north, how far is that? What do you think? He goes 15, 20 miles maybe. I said, okay. And I turned exactly about 45 degrees south. And I'm like, how far is that mountain? He goes, I don't know, 15, 20 miles. And I said, okay. So between the two, what's the curvature? Yeah. And he looks at me and he goes, crap. <laughs> <laughs> crap. And I saw light dawn on yonder window. 
But that's um, actually really powerful. But, yeah, that's that's a really good one. Literally, he took it in, and of course, the next thing that he took from me was, "Go live your life." And next thing I know is he's writing me from Thailand. <laughs> so you know, <laughs> perhaps there's advice that you can give those individuals. I think that that is really a, a strong point, which is if things are disappearing beyond the curvature in front of you, then when you look from side to side, you should be able to see that amount of curvature. That's absolutely true. And it is because you can do the math and you can say, okay, if I go out 10 miles to the left and I go out 10 miles to the right, it's Pythagorean theorem, 25 miles in between. And no, I'm not doing A squared plus B squared equals C squared. But we can do the math. And we can do the math over what our visual perspective is. Yeah. People think differently. Some people are very visual thinkers. Some people are very analytical. And even amongst those subsets, people have different approaches to what makes sense to them. So for someone who's very visual, if you say to them, look from the far left to the far right, where's the curvature in between? You're not seeing it. For some people, that's it. They're convinced. They're flat earthers. For others, they look at that and they're like, yeah, but uh, that doesn't make sense. They need the math. So for you, the atmosphere, the wind, that works for you. But for other people, that's too abstract. And they'll be like, well, but I don't really know about how the wind works. I don't really even know what causes it. There are limits to our sensory perceptions. We have a visual vanishing point. So we do see the sun appear to go down to the horizon. And unless you have the ability to look into it and learn that actually that has to do with perspective and resolution, if you were only guided by what you yourself see, you would say, well, I see the sun going down to the horizon, not going away from me. So I think we have to be careful when we want to simplify things that we don't dumb it down to the point where then it becomes belief, right? You believe the sun is going down because you see it going down. Well, it's not actually that's perspective that makes it appear to be going down, but it's actually moving away from you. In the same way, let's use something less controversial. The electricity lines, the power lines, if you're standing on a road in the middle of the plains in Central America or Central Canada, then the power lines, as they go along beside the road, as they move away from you, they appear to be shorter and shorter. They're moving downward in your visual field, but they're not actually moving down. They're just moving away from you. And so I think that we do have to be careful about saying if something is really simple, then it's true, because that's not the case. And that's why I disagree with some of what Mark Sargent is pushing. When you dumb things down too much, then people just accept rather than think. And that's I think that's dangerous. Now, explain that rainbow to me, because that to me looks like it is refracting off the dome. Oh, Um, wait, wait. Was that Lori? Lori, did you actually admit to that? That's off the <laughs> dome there, buddy. I mean, I mean, doesn't does it not? Because if you were to actually put the light spectrum out here, you can see where the point is right about here and how it just refracts in off a curvature. That's an interesting image. I haven't that seen is- that one before. Oh, did I bring something new to the table? Yes, Let I did. <laughs> and look at the light in the clouds as well, which is interesting because that means the light, the sun, the point of origin is a lot more closer towards horizon. Yeah, it's a lot closer. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So this pilot noticed that the sun was closer than it should have been. Or the pilot is showing that the sun is actually far closer than the 93 million miles. I think it's wonderful that people are making these videos, that people are trying to find out for themselves more about the world around them. I think that that's just fantastic. It's the citizen scientist, and I think that's what we should encourage. I think we should, too, because of the fact that, you know, there's so much that people themselves have to bring to the table. A lot of things we've been talking about tonight, I hadn't really thought about. I've been taking notes when I do my interviews because then I go back and I take a look and I do the research on the things that we've talked about. And I think it's good for people to do their own due diligence. Don't believe anything we say. Just get out there and and try to prove us wrong. That is a wonderful perspective. But it's not necessarily about these individuals doing due diligence about recording things they see. 
It's about the scientific method. If we can't right. produce it, then perhaps something else is going on. And just like that video, and, and I've, I've seen that before, where you can stand out across the Chicago Bay and look at Chicago. What was it? 40, 60 miles? And you can just sit there you with... You weren't supposed to be able to see it. The, the Chicago skyline from Michigan. Right. So I think it's, it's seven miles, tell you the truth. If you can see that over that course of time, and the individual that was recording it actually made the point of saying, hey, we've been out here all day and we're still seeing the same thing. Yes. Or the flats in, is it Argentina that has the salt flats where it's... Just, B Bolivia, I think. Yeah. Bolivia. Where it's just flat for 100 miles in any direction. You can recreate these things on a constant basis that's awesome. That provides solidity to the scientific method. But if you run across these things which don't make sense, then that actually leads to questioning the scientific model that we've been presented from kindergarten. And, you know, here's something I want to say, and this kind of speaks to my detractors. And the whole point of this is to say, just because someone in a white coat who looks authoritative tells you that something is true, that doesn't mean it's true. You still have to look at the, right. you have to assess the validity of the idea. You have to assess it on its own merits. You cannot judge whether something is true or not true based on whether the person telling you looks professional, looks like a scientist, has an $18 billion annual budget and happens to be named NASA. And the reason I wear a princess dress in a lot of my videos and I show cleavage and I'm very feminine and I have my pigtails is because I'm trying to say, here's information. If you use the fact that I'm wearing a princess dress to help you evaluate the validity of my argument, then you are being foolish and you're just part of the scientism religion because rather than evaluate the idea itself, you're trying to use my princess dress to tell you whether or not my idea is good or true. And that's why we get sucked in by scientists and we get sucked in by NASA is because they look professional. They look look like they're telling the truth and so we think oh that must be true that's what i'm trying to get people to move away from that was one of the things on tv like you have to be a certain way we have to say it doesn't matter what someone looks like what they're wearing if their voice is high pitched and if they're giggling what matters is is the information that they're giving you is that information itself valid or true or right and that's why i have a really big problem with the flat earth community on youtube is because i think it's really hypocritical to say to people stop believing nasa just because they're giving you composite images but then they look at my videos and they say stop wearing a princess dress because because you're undermining the credibility of the flat earth. <laughs> That's my rant, sorry. <laughs> well, we've got to say that I'm going to be perfectly honest with you because, you know, Scott did say that I'm very outspoken. I, I did have my reservations because I had not checked out your, your channel. And I did have my reservations about your channel at first until I started watching your videos. I love your presentation. Thank you. Information is, is fantastic. I think you should continue to do what you do. And whoever has not checked out Orphan Red's channel, I really strongly go over there and go and give her her information a, a look because it's right up there. You're one of my favorite channels now. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> just to give you a little science validity. Because I mm -hmm. used to be so much into science as the only path to truth, it was really surprising to me to see that there's a lot of truth in religious texts. You look at the Bible and it's surprising. I've realized that as much as science tries to beat this out of us as children, it seems to me that truth is actually discovered by humans in different ways. And we have come to think that the only path to truth is the scientific method. But it seems to me that that's not true because we like if you look at v Hinduism, there a lot of their ideas are very similar to quantum theory. I really, truly want to thank you, Sasha, for joining us today. This has been so fun. I'm so glad that we did this. It was very enjoyable. And I think that we learn from each other. And I think it's really good to see people coming together from different areas of YouTube and just talking about ideas. I think this is really good. So I'm glad. Thank you so much for having me.